Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray all is well with you and that uh, once again uh, that you're starting your day with the Word of God and that you're ending your day with the Word of God. Okay. I keep pushing that brother and sister Christ because I've talked to some of the brethren that are going through some hard times, whether it's financially, it's physically, it's spiritually. Um, and the number one reason, one thing I always hit them up with is are you starting your day with the Word of God in prayer? And seeking God every day with the life that you're going to, like the day that you're going to live for the Lord, you talk to Him about it. And you read the Word of God and keep trying to hide God's Word in your heart. And some of the brethren are coming back going, well, uh, no, I really haven't, brother. And I keep stressing, brother, says Christ, the number one solution is, are you staying in the Word of God in prayer? Do you have a strong prayer life? And a strong Bible reading slash Bible studying life, hiding God's Word in your heart and living it. But before we get into this uh, study, are you are you ready to witness? Okay, we're going to start uh, talk a little bit about some encounters I've had, and we're going to go over some of the scriptures to exhort the brethren to continue being a living witness and a verbal witness in these last days. But I'd like to start with a hymn if we can. Okay, uh, blessed assurance, blessed assurance. Okay. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Praising the... When you when talk about praising your Savior with the life that you live is the best way to play, praise the Lord God Almighty. You can do it with your words, but we see the world doing it with their words all the time, brothers says Christ. It's the life that you live is where you really praise God. Okay? Remember, made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. It talked about that, watching and waiting, looking above. Okay? We're waiting and looking for that blessed hope. Now I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But get out your King James Bibles. Okay. Perfect written word of God in English. And turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read the whole chapter. And I'm not going to go into it in big detail. But as we're reading this, okay, we're going to be talking about preaching the gospel. What kind of things can happen to you when you preach the gospel. What you go through. When you're trying to be a living witness and a verbal witness, okay? And what motivates us to be a, a verbal and living witness. It's all here in this chapter. So we're just going to read this chapter together, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, or not 18, 1 through 18. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Remember, don't faint, don't falter. To have done all to stand, Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Right? We faint not, but having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Over here, if you go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. And we've talked about this a lot lately, about how people, even brethren, are having a hard time Handling the Word of God and believing it just as it is, without adding to it or subtracting to it with your words. But there's a lot, this whole world is all about taking the Word of God out of your hands. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as in sincerity, but of God and sight of God, speak we in Christ. 
but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's cons conscience in the sight of God. And I've said this before, the Bible teaches that it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel it's for today. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Okay? And people are against that. Why would you be against it? Well, sin comes to play. Lust of the flesh. You don't want to give up the lust of the flesh, sin and wickedness after salvation. You don't want to throw your iniquity on the foot of the cross. You love your sin. You have no problem with your sin. So you just have the head knowledge of what Jesus did and what he went through. And you refuse to confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Remember, to show that you're not ashamed and to show that you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. I still don't deserve it. I'm talking about me now. I still don't deserve salvation. It's a gift of God. It's a free gift. But conscience in the sight of God, what happens when we try to witness for Jesus Christ and it doesn't go too well? Verse 3. Now I'm going to give you a couple times that I've tried witnessing recently. didn't go too well. Sometimes it's real quick. It goes so by so fast. You're like, uh, I really want... You know how some people have that plan? i got this whole planned speech, you know, the gospel. And you don't hardly get any, a few lines out. And, and, the, con and the, the confrontation, you know, the moment where you're talking, it's just over so quick. They walk away. And you're like, but I didn't get to get the good points in, you know. <laughs> Verse 3 says, but if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. People don't want it. Oh, are we supposed to give up because people don't? you think people don't want it? No. We're supposed to keep doing it because God commands us to. And we'll get into some of that some of those verses later. We're supposed to preach the gospel, whether we see people getting saved or we don't. Because a lot of times, if you're like me, Bush Christ, you like to go out and you like to give out lay out gospel tracts everywhere. Okay, you put out some a, a few videos with gospel messages, with videos and everything. You don't know what impact you've had. The Lord has used you. You don't know. Okay. We just, we're just we not commanded to do it based off the fruit. We're commanded to do it because the Lord call, commands us to do it. We're doing it to please our, our Lord and Savior. We're to preach the gospel. Okay. Remember what Paul said in verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not. Well, it looks like people don't want it. doesn't matter. You still have to keep trying to give it to them. Now, you don't force feed it. If someone doesn't want the truth, we're going to get into some of those verses. They don't want the truth. I'll show, we'll talk about what the Bible says to do when they don't want the truth. But it says here, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom, how is it hid to them that are lost? In whom the God of this world, the lowercase g God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. How has the lowercase g God blinded this world? By taking this from them. I mean, you look at the world today as a whole, they believe in a Jesus Christ. How has Satan blinded this lost world? He's offered them antichrist, false Christs, counterfeit Jesuses that's the Jesus they want. Not the Jesus they need. They need the Jesus of the King James Bible. That's what they need. But he offers them the Jesus that they want, the Jesus that's okay with sin and worldliness. And you're living however you want. Only believe, only believe. You know, repentless gospel. No changed life gospel. After Change life after salvation, you know. No pr a prayerless gospel. A repentless gospel. Head belief. Okay. He offers them a Jesus that isn't real. A fake Jesus. A counterfeit Jesus. He offers them a false gospel. A gospel that, they, that, that, that pleases them. You know, where they don't have to give up sin. They don't have to have a changed life. They don't have to be sorry for sinning against God. And he gets them to receive another spirit. Remember what Paul said? If any man preach another Jesus whom we have not preached, gets you to uh, preach another gospel whom we'd, we haven't preached also, and will get you to receive another spirit which we haven't received. He's blind in the mind of this world. Why? Because he offers in the world. What was one of the things that Satan offered Jesus? The world. Remember when he was being tempted for 40 days? Fasting 40 days? He tempted him with the world. 
He offered him the world. And that's what Satan does. He blinds the minds of them that believe not. We're, try, we're supposed to be a light in this dark world, putting on the armor of light, putting on Jesus Christ, the whole armor of God. And we're supposed to shine for Jesus Christ in this dark world. It's not a coincidence that when Jesus came back, he was healing a lot of blind people. It's not a coincidence that Paul, he was blinded on the way to Damascus with truth. Not the, you know, he, he was hit with truth, he was blinded, and then someone came and actually, you know, filled in the dots, crossed every T, dotted every I. Uh, I forgot the guy's name, but he came and, and he preached the gospel and who Jesus is and everything to Paul. And when Paul had the truth, it said things fell from his eyes and he could see again. He was no longer blind. That's what we're here for, brothers Christ, to be a light in this dark world. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves. You see that a lot with a lot of people. It always, it always Some brethren, please, brothers Christ, take this as a love, a correction, and a rebuke and love. Some of the brethren in ministry, it's become about themselves. It's not about Jesus Christ anymore. It's not about His perfect written word. It's about the world and themselves. Watch out for ministries, not just the brethren that have fallen away, but a lot of fake ministries out there. It's about themselves. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Versus Christ, we're supposed to be a servant to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're also supposed to be a servant to the lost world. And how are we a servant to the lost world? By preaching the truth to them. The gospel of our salvation. How we got saved and let them know if God could save a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner like this man right here, He can save you. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's us. Or first it was Jesus Christ when He first physically came. He was in the flesh. He was the light of the world. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Jesus was there shining His light on all their wickedness and sin. Today, that's what we do. We're supposed to be living a separate life from the rest of the world, a holy life, a sanctified life, a clean life, a life based off the truth. And that light of us living, that's the living witness, shines on them, shines on their, their life that is just darkness. It's sin and wickedness. They're on their way to hell. And we can witness to them and tell them how they can go to heaven. Shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What do you go through when you're preaching the truth? Verse 8, for we are troubled on every side. Especially when you're preaching the gospel. Yet not distressed, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. The old man is dead and buried. The new man is raised with Jesus Christ. All right? That's what it's talking about here. We have to keep putting the flesh. Paul talks about bringing every thought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. And we're supposed to bring our flesh into subjection. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We're supposed to be sanctified. We're supposed to be holier than the lost world. Okay? And as we're doing that, our light shines on them. But most of the time, it shines on them and they don't like it. <laughs> like, it goes back to John, 3, uh, John chapter 3 where it talks about Light has come in the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. Neither come into the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. They hate true Bible-believing, God-fearing men. You'll get two responses. Someone will either hate, hate you. I'll say three. You'll, because today they're pushing this ecumenical movement. In the past, you get two responses. They either hate you and want nothing to do with you, or they're interested in what you have. The Word of God hidden in your heart. Jesus Christ. They want what you, they're interested in what you have, and they might hear more about what you have to say. Those used to be your two responses. Today we have this huge ecumenical movement where we can all just hold hands and sing kumbaya. Okay, so you might get that third where we're just neutral. Or you know, I I I don't I don't, I don't like you, but I don't hate you. 
It's one of those situations. But always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, that presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's a day-to-day -day process to put on the whole armor of God and put down the flesh and to bring your thoughts into subjection to the obedience of Christ. It's a it's a day-to-day, -day, it's a day-to-day -day task. Verse 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Now Paul, what I believe Paul's talking about here is, is the life of someone who's an evangelist. Remember, an evangelist goes out and actually gets into people's faces. Not like being mean or anything like that, but they go places and they speak up in front of everybody and they're preaching the gospel in huge groups and they're going everywhere to the lost world, trying to be a light in the lost world. And they're setting up churches, um, um, uh, ordained elders, bishops, deacons, how the church is supposed to operate. After they set up churches, they go back to evangelizing. They'll come back and confirm the churches and say, hey, are you still doing good? Are you still you know, lining up with this book? Are you doing right? Okay. And when you have someone, real quick, I don't believe everyone's called to pre, uh, preach the gospel as an evangelist. Okay, The Bible says that's an office. That's a calling. Not everyone's called to do that. And when they kick the Babel buildings, the Babel buildings tend to push that everyone's supposed to be like an evangelist. You're all supposed to be out there on the street corners doing something for the Lord, preaching the gospel and all this. Like, because they're, they're whole, that's, that's their money making. They treat the, the people in the Babel buildings are, are merchandise. They make merchandise of you. And the more people they can get into these Babel buildings, the more money they can make. Now, we are all, the whole point of this, are you ready to witness. We're all supposed to be a living witness, but we're not all called to be an evangelist. And those that are called to be an evangelist, like Paul was, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he's also an evangelist, and all those after him, Timothy, Silas, um, Timoth uh, Timothy, Timothus, uh, Titus, okay? all these brethren, uh, Philip, the evangelist, and the church that's in his house, when you actually stand up to be an evangelist, and you really put yourself out there, you're going to be in more danger. Okay? And that's what he's saying. So then death worketh in us. Their, their, their lives are always at risk, hardcore. But life in you, brothers and Christ, who aren't called to be evangelists, we're still supposed to be a living witness. How we live every day. They're supposed to see Jesus Christ in us. 13. We having the same spirit of faith according to his written... I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us, raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. Okay, now, Paul was a, a martyr. You have a lot of people being martyred for Jesus Christ preaching the gospel. Right? But he's like, don't worry, we're going to be raised up. Because then we're going back to the third, the last part of this is the motivation What's the motivation to be a living witness and a verbal witness? Verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. Remember we start up there? Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. He talks about the gospel, preaching the gospel, and how the, the gospel be hid. It's hid to them that are lost. For which cause we faint not, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. As you go out there and preach the gospel, the inward man is going to be renewed day by day. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have days that you think are failures. You're going to have days that you're going to be praising God. It went well. But you're supposed to live a life of Christ every day. And any time you stumble and you fall, you pick up that cross, you deny yourself, Pick up that cross daily and get back to following Jesus Christ. Those three steps. Okay. Notice it says pick up your cross daily. Because God knows the flesh. He knows man. He knows how wicked this world is. He knows we stumble and fall. Okay? Pick up your cross and get back to following ASAP. But the inward man is renewed day by day. That's an exhortation. That's encouragement. You, and that goes back to what I said. You feel like you're going through hard times. You feel like everything's starting to fall apart. Get back into the Word of God in prayer. 
And the next thing you know, God will start opening doors. God will shed light to say, hey, look, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Because there's times I've looked at things and just get really, like, scared and be like, ugh. And, God, and I'll, I'll get to praying. And I'll get to listening to the Word of God. I'll get to, you know. And the next thing you know, God shines a light on it. And it's like, okay, it wasn't as bad as I thought. It wasn't as bad as I thought. Verse 17. But here's the important part. For our light affliction, light affliction? Have you ever read what Paul actually went through? We're not going to go through that now, but you can, you know, look it up. What Paul went through. And perils among false brethren, and perils among the, you know, the heathen, and perils among my own brethren, you know, the kinsmen. Um, you know, perils among the waters and stuff like that. It's just, he was beaten 40 times, save one. You, know, you look at all the stuff he went through, but he looks at it and goes, for, a light, for our light affliction. Hmm. Why does he say our light affliction? Because look what he's comparing it to. Which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Remember we did a series, Trust the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thine own understanding? When does the own understanding come in? When you get so fixated on what can be seen. Instead of just trusting the Lord. And keep your eyes on things that are not seen. But the things which are seen, I see, we look not for the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. What we're going through is just temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Are eternal. So brothers, this is Christ, when you're getting out there and you're witnessing for Jesus Christ, you're going to be going through some experiences and it's going to take some courage. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a good, I don't think I'd make a good evangelist. I mean, getting out there, uh, not trying to be social, but a people person where you can get out there, strike up conversations where you can get it and try to practice getting the conversation steered around to eternity, sin, heaven, hell. There is a God, a creator. There is eternity. There is a coming judgment. There are some brethren out there that are really, really good at it. Really good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, turn to 1 Peter 3.13. They're really good at it. 1 Peter 3.13 But like I said, when it comes to being an evangelist, we're not all called to be an evangelist. But we all are called to be ready to witness. Ready to witness. 1 Peter 3.13 says, and who, is, and who is he that will harm us, or harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, doing what's right, living a life of Christ, Standing up for the Word of God and the true plan of salvation. Standing up for the real Jesus Christ, especially in these last days. Happy are you, especially if we go through hardship and suffering. Which, if I can go off on a little tangent, some of the brethren, once again, a rebuke and correction to some of the brethren. Some of us, and I've even felt sometimes, we tend to forget to give God praise when we're going through hard times. When I've had brethren turn on me and start treating me like with such hate and disdain and I've had the lost world call me names and everything and just people make videos against me just making fun of me and attacking me personally. If it's because of this book, I praise God. If it's because I did something stupid and gave the enemy ammunition to attack him, I need to fall on my knees before the Lord and repent. And I try to. But mostly we're talking about for the Word of God. I'm supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to be praising God. Do you remember Peter and John when they got arrested? What did they do after they got beaten and arrested? What did they do? They'd sing hymns and praise God. Paul and Barnabas when they got arrested and beaten, what did they do? They praised God. They sang hymns. They gave God all the glory. They started thanking God to be counted worthy to suffer for His name, for His gospel, for His word. And it says here, Be not afraid of, the t of their terror, neither be troubled. Verse 15. But, as you're going through hardship in this world, brothers and Christ, and having to deal with the lost world, here it is. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear. We're going to get into a verse. Well, I'll say it now, but the Bible says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. 
And meekness is we're talking to them, and we always, we're always supposed to fear God. We don't let the world deter us. We don't fall into the trap of conforming to the world, being a friend of the world, loving the world, and the things of the world. You know what Satan tries to offer? The world and the lust of the flesh that the world offers. And meekness with fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, I've had a lot of people speak evil of me, as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you Accuse your good conversation in Christ. I've said this before, brothers and Christ. I've had, where I went to witness to a guy, I didn't even get a chance to say anything. He, Because like I said, I'm not that good. I tried to strike up a conversation. It was on the beach. And the guy started talking. And before I could get to anything here, he decided to tell me a joke. And it ended up being a dirty joke. Mm -hmm. And he just thought it was the funniest joke he'd ever heard in his life. And I, I was just standing there. I was like, I didn't know what to do other than I reached in my pocket, pulled out a gospel tract and said, can I give you a gospel tract? And when I did that, he, he's like, started choking up on his laughter. It's like, well, you know, well, it's not that that was a good, good joke. It's just, you know, it's just something I heard and everything. And, and he took the gospel tract from me. What is that? That's my, that light shining on darkness. That's exactly what that was. Okay. Our good conversation, which is in Christ, we always steer the conversation back to being a good to good conversations and good things. Like I said, some brethren are really good at it. I'm still working on it. So we see here, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. I also put it in parentheses, not head. It's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. I've known great men of God that mock the Word of God when it comes to whether it's a head issue or a heart issue. Okay? It's a heart issue. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What are we supposed to hide in our heart? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sanctification. This is the living witness. We see it right here in this verse. It's sanctify the, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. 1 Corinthians 9.14 says, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. You're supposed to be a living witness as well as a verbal witness. Today, a lot of people are just all talk. And since all these false Christs are out there, these counterfeit Jesus are out there, all these false gospels are out there, all these false organized religions are out there, when you're all talk, it's like, eh, you got to either be a good, a good salesman, got to give a good sales pitch, like our Babel, like the Babel buildings are, you know, trying to get more people in to get more money. You have to be a, uh, like a politician or a car salesman, and that's not how we're supposed to be. We're just supposed to preach the truth as it is, take it or leave it. Okay? You're supposed to be a living witness. Not just a verbal witness. People aren't paying attention today. I think the number one reason why people are really turned off, blind, the gospel be hit, it's hit them blind. I've already explained why, but how it's hard to reach people today because we go out there and we talk just like a lot of these false converts, false religions do. What's supposed to be different? We're supposed to be a living witness. Like I said, the moment I pulled out this gospel track and I kept my language clean and I tried to steer the conversation to clean things, he saw it. It wasn't just my words. It was my actions. Okay? I think he cussed a couple times. I didn't cuss. Okay? I can go on and on about this, but you're supposed to be a living witness. We see that there in 1 Peter chapter 3. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The next part says, Give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Yes, we're supposed to be a verbal witness, but today our problem is that everyone's all talk. Not everyone, but most of, even the people I would consider saved, they're, they're all talk. Where's the walk? Brothers and Christ, you need to be working hard on your walk to be in a living witness. Okay. Give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you. It's a verbal witness. 1 Corinthians 9.16, it's like two verses down. It says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. 
Now, for an evangelist, it really hits home. I, that's what God called me to do, to get out there. But for us, brothers and Christ, yes, when God opens doors, we're always supposed to be ready to give an answer. Okay? When God opens doors to witness, we're supposed to be a living witness, and the verbal witness comes in when you're ready to give an answer. I'm sorry, when God opens doors, you've got to be ready. Sometimes you get blindsided. Speaking of which, um, uh, I was sitting at the truck again. Uh, Fridays, it's like Fridays and Mondays. I didn't plan this, but Fridays mornings and Monday mornings is like my, uh, not evangelizing, but witnessing time. <laughs> you remember, you're a witness 24-7. Don't get me wrong. We're supposed to be witnessing for Jesus Christ 24-7. But I'll go to the bakery, and Monday mornings is uh, pretzel day, and Friday morning I'll grab a donut. And I'll go over and I'll sit by the, there's a spot over in town by the harbor where it's a tourist uh, spot where a lot of people come because you can park right next to the water. People do their walk up and down. It's just a little section of coast, but they also have places just up, up on the coast that the elderly walk around, and there's a little camp place there. And I go and I'll pull up there and I have my Bible magnets and everything. Okay. So I'm sitting there, I have the window down, I have this window cracked, I have uh, my tablets in the other room. Tablet playing Alexander Scorvey, sometimes it plays music and I pray. Uh, and some, a lot of times though I like to go there and listen to the Old Testament books. Uh, Alexander Scorvey reading the Bible. So Alexander Scorvey was reading and I'm sitting there and I've got a pretzel. And I'm about to take a big bite of the pretzel, and some guy comes running up to me. Because he saw the magnet on my truck. And one of the magnets on my truck says, If you die tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? Gets him to think of eternity. And if there's a heaven and there's a hell, then there's somebody that we're accountable to. There's a judgment coming deciding who gets to go to heaven and who gets to go to hell. I like that, that magnet. There's so much that, that, that needs to be added when it comes to talking about the gospel, but it's a great opener. And I know everyone tries to use it, even the false converts, false religions, false they all try to use that. But the guy came over and he saw it and he just kind of blindsided me, he just ran up to the truck and he pointed at that magnet and he looked at me and says, when's the last time you've asked yourself that question? Now, I've never had anybody do that before. He comes up and points at it and says, when's the last time... You've asked yourself that question. I looked at him and went, I don't have to ask myself that question anymore. Well, why not? Because I know where I'm going when I die. Yeah, but, but how do you know? Now, my Bible was, I have it, I keep a Bible in, in the truck, and I just, I quoted to him, uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And before I could get the next verse, because you know the verse I always follow this up with is, uh, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When God saves you, you're saved. But he cut me off, and he started quoting John something. Now I'm going to stop here for a second to make a point. Brothers says Christ, when I was part of the easy believism, faith alone, faith alone, uh, false gospel, I was even part of the Bible perversion, um, Bible buildings. The number one place we'd go to for salvation wasn't the Pauline epistles. It was the book of John. And I learned in my experience, Brother Jesus Christ, of becoming a Bible believer, coming to the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, which is told at the end of Acts when Paul says, I've hid nothing from you. I've told you the whole gospel. I told you everything on how to get saved. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work of death. How that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he died and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. How he died for, I'm sorry, how he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. With the, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Repent. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here, we just read about a heart issue again. It's always the heart. 
It's a heart issue, not a head issue. Repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. We're supposed to be, present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead? We saved sinners. Sinners that are saved by God's grace, how are we that are dead live any longer therein? There's all kinds of verses saying, yes, the changed life is guaranteed. Okay? But that's the true plan of salvation. Be, be careful, brothers and Christ, when people love to go to John, 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 John. What about, everything I just quoted comes from uh, Romans, Corinthians, and the Pauline epistles. I never knew any of the, the Pauline epistle verses. For salvation when I was a false convert. It wasn't until I came to the true saving grace, the true plan of salvation. Paul says, my gospel, the gospel that was revealed to Paul, okay, to give to you word, Paul talks about. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, appointed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, here's the gospel for today, now start preaching it to the Gentiles. And that's what Paul did. But they don't like that. They don't like the real gospel. You know, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost. But back to the story. So the guy tries to run to John. I said, well, you, you, you really get the, the gospel for today from Paul the, in the Pauline epistles. Okay? And before I could get any verses off, he cut me off and said, well, what's the first step to salvation? Now I stopped for a second. I don't know why. In, in my head, you know why I normally start out? Repentance towards God. That's what I normally start out with. Repentance towards God. But for some reason, I could see this man's attitude. And God put it in my heart and he said, you know what? Guess what I answered that man? He asked me, what's the first step to salvation? And I said, the fear of God. It just came out, the fear of God. Well, well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, we know, yeah, but, but you know, it's, it's turning from your sins and to turn to God. And I stopped him and I said, you know, I, when he, after he said that, I said, do you know what the Bible says repentance is? The Bible definition of repentance? And he cut me off and said, you know what? You know what? He pointed at my magnet and he said, you know what? You're going to hell. You know what? You're lost. You're just, you're going to hell. And he just starts storming off. And all I kept trying to point him to was this. Now, brothers says Christ, I kicked this so much. Repentance and turning are two different things. And today, Satan has used false gospels, Bible perversions, to get people to think that turning has anything to do with repentance, and it doesn't. It doesn't. Please hear me out, brothers says Christ. Repent. If you go through the Old Testament, through when uh, Jesus was preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel, to today, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, it was repent and turn from your wickedness. Repent and turn. Repent and turn. Repent and turn. And means it's two different things. But somehow they've taken the word and out and made them one and the same. They're not. Today we're not commanded to repent and turn. Today we're commanded to repent and believe. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is having godly sorrow for your personal sins. Some people can say it's a change of heart. Absolutely. Not a change of mind. That's what, Jesus, that's what God does when he repents. It's a change of mind. He was going to do something, but because you repented, he's going to forgive you, and now he's not going to do that punishment like he was. When God repents, it's a change of mind. The Bible in the Old Testament says that God is not man, that he should repent. In other words, man's repentance is not the same as God's repentance. When God repents, it's a change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. But they're trying to take the heart issue and make it a head issue. And they keep messing up the scriptures. Turn does mean get clean up your life. But they always say, well, repentance is just, it works because it's cleaning up your life. No, repent and turn. Two different actions. Repentance happens in the heart. The turning is, the outward, is on the outside. It's the physical work. Repent 
and turn. We're not to repent and turn. We're supposed to repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I was going to get him in there to try to talk to him about, hey, but I didn't get any verses off how God, you know, I had all this stuff in my head. God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save such that be of a contrite spirit. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. But the sorrows, uh, the, for godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay? O wretched man that I am. The wages of sin is death. That's what you're sorry for. You're sorry for your sins and the consequences of those sins. Or the cost of sin. I never got to that point. He just stormed off real quick. And it's like, Brother Jesus Christ, when you're trying to witness, I was there, the, my, the Bible magnet's there, there's people that always walk by and say, Heaven! And I say, I'll, I'll say, I hope so. There's times where I've been tempted to say, Prove it. Can you prove it? Paul says, check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Can you prove it? Because most of the people that walk by look like the that say heaven. They look like the world. They act like the world. They talk like the world. Brothers, is Christ. I kind of jumped ahead when I talk about the repent and turn, repent and turn, because. Uh, Another instance I had on here, it's not just going there into town, Brother Sis Christ, but online I had a, a, a woman come at me and say, well, it's no longer repent and be baptized. It's just believe. I said, uh, she got it wrong. She got it so wrong because she can't handle what the Bible says. It's not repent and be baptized. You're right. Water baptism, Brother Sis Christ, I'll do a whole other study someday, but water baptism was the Jews, it's part of the kingdom of heaven gospel, and it's the Jews cleansing themselves, turning from their sins, getting water baptized to wash their sins away, to get clean because your king is coming. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Water baptism has no place in the gospel today. Nor does it have any meaning and bearing when it comes to the outward showing. I've already said this before. The outward showing is the changed life. Sanctification. The stands you take. How you live. How you talk. Right? How you treat people. It's the outward. That's the outward showing. Being a living witness is the outward showing, not water baptism. In fact, when I look into the study, water baptism has nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Paul talks about the old man is dead and buried, and the new man is raised, he's not talking about baptism. Okay? He's talking about you, you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. The evidence that you gave your life to Jesus Christ is at the cross is he gives you a new life, and that new life is in Christ, and you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You belong to him. He commands you obey. I've had people attack me. God's not some kind of dictator, uh, uh, commander-in-chief dictator. He's my friend. They don't want the real Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a just God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us will give an account of himself to God. Everyone has to answer to Jesus Christ someday. Okay? He's not just our friend. He's not just our Savior. He's capital K, King of Kings. He's capital L, Lord of Lords. He's creator of heaven and earth. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's perfect. He's just. He's a judge. He's a commander. Remember the Old Testament with Joshua? I believe that was Jesus Christ, where he says, Are thou not for us or for the enemy? And he says, Nay, but of the captain of the host of heaven have I come. Jesus is called the captain of the host of heaven. He's our captain. He's our commander. Yeah, but people don't want that. But this is from Christ. Will get the, yes, it's not repent and be baptized. But what got dropped was the water baptism because we get baptized by Jesus Christ. 
And that what we get baptized with is the blood of Jesus Christ. It washes us clean. Jesus washes us clean through his blood. Because it's God the Father's blood. But we still have to repent. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance has always been there. Well, the, the, the biggest things that I push more than anything nowadays when it comes to the gospel, in the past, you didn't have to. You didn't have to push repentance, brothers and sisters Christ. People came broken. You can just preach what Jesus Christ did for them at the cross and get them to go to the cross and throw the old man at the foot of the cross so God could give them a new man. The new birth. The new creature in Christ Jesus. But today... I've got testimony, i got a testimony over here of a sister in Christ that she emailed me, but i got to get her permission to be able to do a video with it. But she talks about how she had all the information, part of organized religion, had all the information, and she came from a, a tough life, a very tough life. And the one thing that, that put it all together was repentance. True, when she learned what the true biblical definition of repentance was, it all came together and she got saved. To God be all the glory, she got saved and born again. What was that? What true repentance was. Having godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. Throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross. That old woman at the foot of the cross. They've always taught her that, you know, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. Or repentance is works. You know, or repentance is just turning from your sin and turning to God and everything. And all that garbage. No, repentance is, come, is having godly sorrow for your personal sins. In the Old Testament, they had to have sorrow for sinning against God. They had to come to God broken and humble themselves. And then they had to put away that wickedness and say, Lord, save us. This is Old Testament. They had to come broken first, that godly sorrow for their sins and their wickedness. Then they'd get rid of the idols and the groves and every green tree, you know, and they'd get rid of all the paganism and the sin, and then they would ask God for help. That's Old Testament. Today we have to come to the cross and throw our iniquities at the foot of the cross. O wretched man that I am. O wretched man that I am. I'm the chiefest of sinners. God be merciful to me, a sinner. You don't go to the cross saying, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but he's a sinner and that person, you know, I'm like that Pharisee and the publican. I'm not, you don't go to the cross like that Pharisee. Notice he never, I always say this, he never denied being a sinner. He just said, I'm not as bad as that person over there. Oh yeah, you're a sinner. I'm saying, well, we're all sinners. That's not biblical repentance. Repentance, just admitting you're a sinner. That's not true biblical repentance. It's not admitting that you're a sinner. It's just, that's the first part, but uh, having sorrow for it. Well, yeah, I'm a sinner, so what? Do you know there's a hell? There's a what? And then you start telling about hell and the consequences of sin and where they're going to spend eternity. And that admitting that you're a sinner turns to having sorrow now for said sin. You know, the number one thing I hear from the false gospels, primarily from a lot of the false gospels, not the false people that pretend to be King James Bible believers and they're still preaching this faith alone heresy, you know, uh, repentless gospel, prayerless gospel. But I'm talking about the Bible perversion world and everything. You know the one thing they hit you up with? They say you shouldn't be preaching on hell. They don't like you talking about hell when it comes to leading people to, to salvation. What is God saving you from? They don't want to hear that. Those are people that come to the cross with the knowledge, like those people that were just mocking Jesus Christ and, and, and making fun of Him. And everything. That's them. They come to the cross, oh, yeah, he died on the cross, yeah, he's, he's, he died for the sins of the world and everything. They have the knowledge. And then they turn around and go back to being the same way they were before they came to the cross. Nothing changed. It's not repent and be water baptized. That's Old Testament. That's the kingdom of heaven gospel. Today it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And that's what we need to keep preaching, brothers and Christ. And I'm telling you right now, the only way to reach some of the people in these last days is you've really got to drive home what true biblical repentance is. Because a lot of, almost everyone I've talked to has the knowledge that Jesus died. Even, that some might say for our sins, but they don't understand what that means because it hasn't hit here. 
They'll just say it. I've caught brethren, good, I believe men of God that are saved, that they, they slip up and they leave out for our sins. They'll say how he died, uh, how he died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. They leave out for our sins. Guess what? Most of the world, professing Christian world, that have a profession of a Jesus Christ, they do the same thing. They leave out for our sins. This People who come in and try to pretend like they're one of us, Bible believers preaching faith alone, they leave out for our sins. That's why they like to, I forget, there's one guy that likes to go to Romans for his, his gospel, and he ignores 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. He hates it. For our sins. Because where he grabs the gospel, it doesn't mention it for our sins. At least he doesn't think so. I, I think I remember going through, we might do a video on this one of these days. I went through those verses in Romans. I was like, wait a second. It actually still talks about sin. Just not in your face, like obvious. But for those who know how to compare Scripture with Scripture, he is talking about repentance. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord. You can't get away from it. But they keep trying. They keep trying. One time I was out there, and I was pre uh, with, the, with the truck again, sitting there. I got out to do my walk, because there's a place to walk along the water. You go all the way back around to where the, the river is, uh, the Chetco River that comes out there. And right now the boats are going back and forth because they're trolling, and they're trying to get, uh, I can't remember if it's salmon or steelhead. I think it's still salmon, maybe. Uh, salmon, steelhead, and trout are the three. Uh, rainbow trout, and then uh, different types of trout. But the boats are going back and forth, so we, I walk around along the river a little bit, and then you come back inward towards the uh, marina where all the boats are docked. And there's a uh, otter down there. It's the longest otter ever that lives down there in that area. And sometimes we get to see some babies, not babies, but seals that still have their spots. That means they're still young. They're getting big. They're just on the verge of losing the spots and going to a solid color. They're they're on the the docks there sometimes. So we just go. I go for a full walk, talking with the Lord. And as I came back around, there was a guy standing out in front of my truck, just waiting, just waiting. And I come and sit and talk to him. And he's like, "Yeah, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect written word." And we got to talking, and he talked about his he's old, really old man, and he talked about being part of the Hell's Angel, Hell's Angels, uh, down in California. And how he got out, God got him out of that, and he was an uh, evangelist witnessing to those guys and trying to witness and witness, and he got to a certain age where he just decided to come up here. God brought him up here, and now he's still trying to do some witnessing for the Lord up here. And we got in conversations about the true plan of salvation, how about the King James Bible being God's perfect written word, and I started talking to him about dispensational teaching, then he had to go, because remember, those are the three main things you always got to hit on first and foremost. Are they really a King James Bible believer? I believe that guy was. I gave him my gospel, a gospel tract, mainly because it's got my ministry address on there and everything. So you could go check it out. And um, they, I talked about the Bible version issue, the true plan of salvation, and you know, this dispensational teachings, how we have to rightly divide the word of truth. And there's different time periods in history where God is, is reaching a certain people with certain you know, rules and laws. Like today, the gospel that's for today is, was given to Paul. But when Jesus came, it started with John the Baptist, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and then you go back to the Old Testament, the gospel wasn't the same for Adam and Eve as it was for Noah. And the gospel wasn't the same for Noah as it was for Abraham. And so on and so forth. Right? There's different dispensations. But brothers of Christ, you, you'll be shocked. You might come across the Bible believer. You think there's no Bible believers in this? I remember saying that so many times. I don't think there's anybody saved here. Well, I came across one man that it's, it's, I want to say yes, but off of one encounter, but I want to say yes. That man saved and what that man went through. So, so brothers of Christ, you're going to have different experiences. Sometimes they're going to be so quick, that guy comes up, starts throwing questions at you. You try to say, thus saith the Lord, and they're gone before you can finish saying, thus saith the Lord. Sometimes you've got to be careful to try to come up to you and argue with you forever. I told you about that in another video, but I'll say it again. I went up the mountainside. That one video we did, um, are you in Christ Jesus, our Lord, a Christian? Are you a Christian in Christ? I think is what it was. Are you a Christian in Christ? And I wanted to share with you guys one of the spots that I go to 
and like to sit out there and listen to the Word of God and just watch them looking at the mountainside and pray and everything. And I remember going up there that one time to set up for it. The guy was already there in a motorcycle. And this guy was, he, he used to be, I want to say, Jehovah's Witness as a kid growing up in the Jehovah's Witness false religion. Um, might have been Latter-day Saints, but basically false religion. Burnt, he got burnt out on false religion, just like I did. Um, and I was like, well, if he's burnt out, maybe he could, he's ready for salvation. But come to find out, he didn't. He, he, he acts like he left false religion, but now he's getting into all the spiritual stuff. He just replaced one false religion with another. So, but the whole, to make the story short, he kept trying to argue with me. And every time I said, thus saith the Lord, he got mad at me saying, you, there you go trying to tell me what to think. I said, no, I'm just trying to preach the truth. And when I realized, like I said, sometimes when you're witnessing, it can be over that quick. Sometimes you, something inside you should be like, this is taking too long. What's going on? He just wants to argue. He just wants to argue and argue. And I finally got to the point and I said, you know what? I can't help you. He loved that answer. He loved it because he was, he, he, he's like, thank you. He actually thanked me out loud and started to walk away to get back on his bicycle, his motorcycle. And I stopped him halfway and I pointed at the magnets. I'm like, one of my magnets is, is will you spend eternity in heaven with God or in hell with Satan? And I pointed at that magnet and said, there is a heaven and a hell. And someday, you're, if you continue to reject Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, you're going to go to hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. There is a coming judgment. And you're not going to be able to talk your way out of it. And he just looked at me, looked at the magnet, looked back at me and went, shrugged his head, got back on his bike, put his helmet on, his bike took off. I was grateful. Another point I want to make some advice to the brethren. I'm still working on this. Before you get into any conversation with them, give them a gospel track. I gave that guy with, on the motorcycle a gospel track. He put it in the pocket of his arm for the jacket, the leather jacket that he had on and everything. And I, sometimes I forget to. That guy that ran up to me and blindsided me when I was eating a pretzel, I forgot to give him a gospel. I should have given him the gospel track first and then talked to him about the magnet. That way, when he storms off, he might forget about it. And later on, like in a few days or later on that day, he might reach in his pocket and it might get him interested to read. Who knows? But try to give him gospel tracts first because it, the verbal witnessing might not work out. And later on, when God has not broken, maybe they'll come across your gospel track. Just a thought. But, uh, Brother Christ, sometimes it goes too long. And you got to say, oh, I'm done. This person doesn't want the truth. What does the Bible say? Cast that not which is holy among the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they turn around and rend you. Okay? We do not force the truth on people that don't want the truth. We're not carsmen, salesmen. We're not politicians like most of the people in the Babel buildings these days. They're like car salesmen. They're politicians. I've said it before, Brother Christ. I disagree with Peter Ruckman on this fact. He was a gardener. I'm a gardener. Okay, I understand that we tend to plant seeds. Uh, he says you have to dig up the ground and then you sprinkle the seeds. And he's talking about how you have to dig up the ground, you know, get people convicted. Uh, that's what God does. The Bible says the Holy Spirit goes out to the world to reprove the world of sin. We're just planting the seeds. We're not digging up the ground. That's what God does. And what we're doing is we're hoping that as we're planting the seeds, because we can't see what the ground looks like, only God does. God sees the man's heart. Now, there's times we can see that someone's not ready, but we can't see whether someone's ready. We can sometimes see that they're not. Like that one guy just told him, I'm sorry, I can't help you. After trying to witness to him and preach the truth to him, he just kept complaining and whining. I said, you know what? I can't help you. And God won't help you until you come to him broken. Thank you. He liked that answer. But we're just supposed to be planting seeds. And where they fall is up to the Lord. That's why I keep saying when we preach the gospel, it might feel like we're, the seeds are all falling on bad ground. Let God deal with that. Let God deal with that. All right. Romans 10.14 says, Romans 10.14, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And also remember, I like to throw in here, before you even get in this, sometimes I like to throw that verse in, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Then you get in here, how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him who they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. When you're witnessing to people, one of the biggest things that they'll see in you when you're saved, born again, and you're living the life of Christ, and your life lines up with this book, which means you've got to be really separate from the world, when everything seems to be falling apart in the world, they see that you still have peace, you still have hope, you still have joy. You still have it together. You're not falling apart like everyone else is. Then they'll come to you. I, I've said this before, uh, four or five years ago. We had a fire. I had to evacuate because fire got within four miles of this house. Uh, big forest fires coming through here. I had to evacuate up to Gold Beach. And I was sleeping on a cot for a week. Sleeping on a cot in the gymnasium of, I think it was like a grade school. And everyone was fearful. We're going to lose our house. We're going to lose everything. And I'm up there. I'm just sitting there. going. I had this highlighted. And I've got the tablet open. was listening to Bible studies and everything. And I was trying to gospel track the bathrooms. They didn't catch me, praise God. Um, and I was trying to help people out. I was there helping people out physically. And I was trying to, trying to witness for some of them. But I remember one, one person asking me. He's like, why aren't you scared? You could lose everything. That's an open door. I was able to give an answer the, of the hope that is in me. Be ready to give an answer. I gave an answer of the hope that is in me. This is what, because I know where I'm going when I die. And right now, I'm in God's hands. No better place to be. No man can take him out of my Father's hand. No man can take him out of my hand. I and my Father are one. I'm in God's hands. I'm in Jesus' hands. I'm in God the Father's hands. I'm in God's hands. The Lord God Almighty's hands. He'll take care of me. I know where I'm going when I die. I was able to witness to some people. I don't know if it did any good. That's where we plant those seeds and God will take care of it because a lot of them are spread out and everywhere. But the gospel of peace, okay? They're supposed to see the hope that's in you. It's a gospel of peace. 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And servants of the Lord must not strive. If someone doesn't want the truth, they don't want the truth. I've had brethren that broke fellowship with me, and they've done it in a nasty way. They've done it in a worldly way, where it goes into backbiting and whispering and bearing false witness and gossip and everything and stabbing you behind the back, sometimes stabbing you in the front and the heart. But brothers in Christ, we're not to strive. If, if I disagree with the brother and I believe it's a gospel I issue, a salvation issue, or a sin issue, then you break fellowship with them and you continue doing the work of the Lord. Watch out for these people on here that their whole ministry is just a gossip ministry. They're trying to cause confrontation. They're trying to cause strife. They're trying to cause, you know, fighting. And they love the backbiting and whispering and bearing false witness. It says here, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. All men. There's times I get frustrated when I try to witness, especially to people that think they're already saved. Or people that have preconceived ideas with their false religions, the Bible perversions, the false gospels, the false Jesus, the false gospels. They've received another spirit. It gets frustrating, but we've got to keep her calm. We've got to keep calm, collected, keep it together. Be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. That's a good big one, brothers of Christ. When we're preaching the gospel, and it seems like the person's not... Our, my thing is, is when I see someone has some knowledge, but not according to holiness, you know, not according to righteousness, they have knowledge, but not according to righteousness, they have some knowledge about Jesus Christ, I, I turn on my teaching mode. I want to teach them the truth. I'm not there to mock them, name call. I'm not there to put them down. I'm not there to get into a debate, get into a huge confrontation. You get into teaching mode. Apt to teach and patient, the Bible says. As you're trying to teach, you got to be patient. These people, like me, when I was a false convert, I was taught false things. I didn't have the truth. you got to be patient. 
Verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness? In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Why? If God, this is your heartfelt desire, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. There's that pesky word repentance again. Godly sorrow for their personal sins they've sinned against them. For being an error. Okay, I'm sorry I was wrong. I'm sorry, brother, I said this wrong. I'm sorry, brother, I, I used the wrong address. I'm sorry, brother, I was kind of hard-hearted on this, and God kind of opened my eyes. This is the actual truth. If that brother knew that to me with the Trinity versus the Godhead, they're, they're giving up the pagan Trinity, praise God, the terms and everything, and sticking with the Godhead of the King James Bible. Praise the Lord. Okay? But we have to be patient. We plant the truth and let, it, let God water it. Remember, I've, Paul says, I've planted a pulse of water, but God gives the increase. We're just planting truth. And we do it in a, te in a heartfelt desire to not strive, being gentle. Teaching is the method, is the way we do it. We're trying to teach people the truth, and we have to be patient. Okay? And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, what happens after that? And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What do we read over here? Verse 3 in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. They're taken captive by him at his will. These false gospels, these false Jesuses, these counterfeit Jesus, Antichrist. The Antichrist spirit that's even now in the world today, another spirit. That woman Jezebel. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by, by his will. This also works towards when you correct a brother in Christ. You have the same attitude. That's why Paul says, put them out for the destruction of the flesh. Give them to, or over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You put them out of your fellowship. All right. It's the same thing, but you still do it in meekness. Your whole heartfelt desire is to see brethren that are fallen get back up. Your heartfelt desire for the lost world is to see them get saved. And I understand, brother, says Christ, when you first get saved, you get excited like I did. And I tried to tell my family members the truth about the Bible version issue and the true plan of salvation and, and, and whatnot. And it didn't go out well for me. In fact, I keep saying this. My mom has forbidden me to talk about the Word of God or Jesus Christ in front of her or my stepdad. I tried. They don't want the truth. I'm done. I keep waiting for doors to open up where she might want change your mind and want to know the truth but right now she doesn't want it right you get excited and that the whole point i was going to make and i started to lose it there for a second forgive me brother says christ forgive me lord is that you get so excited when you're newly saved and you want to tell the truth to people and you get burnt out sometimes real quick because nobody wants the truth brother says christ don't give up don't give up remember luke 15 7 says i say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine ju ninety-nine over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The sister in Christ had the, that message that she, it touched my heart. It made I want God to have all the glory, but it touched my heart to let me know that God is using me. Even if my whole life is to lead one person to Christ, what true biblical repentance is, if that's the key that sets in and opens the gospel and people are getting saved because of it and one person gets saved my life wasn't a waste right. Luke 15 10 says likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth Matthew 10 14 says and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or that city shake off the dust of his feet the parallel passage in Mark says, 1611 says, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, Paul, I believe he's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble when, when he comes back to judge. Because he's preaching the kingdom, of, I don't want to get too much, much, preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel when he was there. Versus in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe the kingdom of heaven gospel is going to come back. 
Only now it's you got to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, who He is. Um, but you see here, you know, receive you. It's instruction in righteousness. When someone doesn't want the truth, you move on. Okay? Luke 9, 5 says, And whosoever will not receive you, when you get out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet for a testimony against them. We just read two different things here, brothers of Christ. One says, All heaven rejoice over one repent sinner that repenteth, than over ninety-nine and nine just men, over ninety and nine just men who need no repentance. When someone gets saved, we, we praise God. It's a great thing. But in these last days, it's a rarity. I've got a point over at the testimony I've got printed out over here. It's, it's a rarity. What we tend to come across more than anything is when we try to preach and witness, we get that they don't want it. Well, we move on. We move on. Acts 13.51, this is the apostles in Acts, said, but they shook off the dust of the feet against them and came to Iconium. They didn't want the truth. Now, I believe in the early book of Acts, they're still preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel, but a gospel is a gospel. Okay? We just need to make sure we have the right gospel for right here and right now. And the gospel for right here and right now is repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And it's followed by a changed life. A new creature in Christ Jesus. You belong to God. Okay? The new birth. The new man in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, Matthew 15, 14. There's the one I get. Let them alone. Matthew 14... Or 15, 14, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leave the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Most of the people I ever come across, they think they know everything. They think they already know the truth. Like I said, there was that one brother in Christ where he did. I believe he was saved. I talked with him a little bit. I believe he did. But most of the time, you're dealing with a lot of people that uh, they have knowledge. And not all that knowledge lines up with this book. But they have that attitude that, we know everything. And I'm going to try to teach you. It's like, chapter and verse on what you just said, it's not there. Chapter and verse on what you said there, it's not there. See what you just did? You just like grab them from John. You know in the book of John, it says, Son of Man, I think we counted, I was talking with the brother in Christ, 15 times. You say, what does that have to think? Son of Man has to do with the kingdom of heaven gospel. Not the gospel that's for today. Has to do with Jesus Christ, who is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the King of the Jews. He's there as their King, Son of Capitalist, Son of Man, going back to his family lineage, back to King David. He's a King, and he's there to rule and reign for the Jewish over the Jewish people, if they would accept him, but they rejected him. All right. But you have to brush, let them alone. They'd be blind leaders of the blind. There's a lot of times, brothers of Christ, it's. That you, you're going to be shocked that the more you try to witness, to be a living witness and a verbal witness, when God opens doors, it's going to be like, you're just going to have to say, I can't help you. Until you come to God broken, God won't save you until you come to Him broken. True biblical repentance. God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and saved such that be of a contrite spirit. Having godly sorrow, which worketh repentance to salvation. Sorrow towards God can't help you. And that's tough, especially if it's loved ones. Especially if it's loved ones. It's tough, but we got to let them alone. When you realize, hey, they're blind, they don't want the truth, let them alone. 1 Corinthians 14, 38, but that doesn't mean we give up on preaching the gospel to anyone. Oh, I had a bad experience here. I got a bad experience here. I'm just going to quit. No, 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 no. We're supposed to always be ready to give an answer. We're always supposed to be ready. 1 Corinthians 14, 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. That goes across the board, not just for salvation, but that goes to when you're dealing with brethren, where you have difference, of, uh, when they go against the doctrines in the Bible that are for today, when they go against, you know, trying to justify sin and wickedness and worldliness, covetousness, idolatry, you know, putting things down here above things up there. And you try to witness to somebody, if any man be ignorant, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You try to preach the truth, but when you realize that you're dealing with somebody who doesn't want the truth, you're done. For this subject, we're talking about witnessing for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a, a, a living witness, but when you go to verbally witness, when you realize you're dealing with someone who's just ignorant as can be. Remember I told you there was a guy I pulled into the bakery before I even got 
No, it was after I got the donuts, uh, not donuts, uh, pretzels. I got in there and got the pretzels, and as I was coming out and I sat down, some guy was coming out, he came over to my dog's side, where the window's down a little bit, and he points at the, the, st the sticker that I have, and he says, so what So what, do you t what happened to that 13th tribe that was in the, in the wilderness and got swallowed up by the earth and everything? Where did they go? <laughs> and I'm like, and he just like, well, uh, I tried to try to talk to him just a little bit. It didn't even last that long. Once again, just one of those quick conversations where he ends it and jumps in the truck, pulls out a cigarette, starts smoking, goes down the road on his way down the road on his way to hell. But you're sitting there going, "What? If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant." I was like, "He's he's taking lots of stories in the Old Testament and just squished it together." Because there was a guy where the tent, the earth opened up. And swallowed the three guys, I think three of them up, that were trying to go against Moses and Aaron. And stuff like that. And there's different stories, but there was no 13 tribes and one just disappeared. And as I talked to a brother in Christ, said, is there some kind of false religion out there that I don't know of? <laughs> that pushes that there once was 13 tribes, not 12? And this is what happened to the 13th tribe? I was like, that guy had no clue what he was talking about. And he didn't stick around to get the truth. He wants to be ignorant. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. All right? And it goes back to 2 Corinthians 4.3, But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Well, now that we're saved, brothers and sisters of Christ, and we have testimonies of a changed life, I'm not the same man that I was when I was lost. God changed me. He gave me a new life. I'm living a cleaner life, a holier life, a life where God's word is hidden in my heart. I'm doing my best to live it, to preach it, to stand by it, to fight for it. Right? If our gospel hits, hits the lost, it's like you think about all these organized religion people, like, why would they want to be lost? Why would they want to go to hell? Well, they've been deceived. Well, we try to preach the truth to them. They don't want it most of the time. But brothers of Christ, they're gonna, it might be rare. You might have to wait. I think when the sister of Christ told me this, this is the only person I've ever heard of up front that I know that God has used me to teach, to preach the gospel to him so that Jesus could save him. And I've been in ministry for six years. Just doing being a Bible preacher on YouTube and some of the other video platforms, but just being a Bible teacher and preaching truth. I've been saved for ten years. And I tried preaching the truth to people when I first got saved. But I've been on YouTube for six years now, maybe seven. You gotta be patient. We read that there. You have to be patient. Apt to teach. Patient. Okay? God's using us, brothers and sisters Christ, as a living witness, as a verbal witness, and sometimes as a bad example. I hate I thought I said, Lord, please, I don't want to be a bad example. I want to be a good example. So make sure God's using you in a good way. But God is using us, brothers and sisters Christ, for planting seeds. Okay? And this is the only one I know of. Okay? The sister in Christ here. It's the only one I know of. There might be others out there who found my gospel tracks and turned to God and did things His way and got saved. Okay? And these last days, it'll feel like the work being done, witnessing, not just living for a life of Christ, but witnessing, is not amounting to much. Remember, you're living for Jesus Christ. It's being accounted for at the judgment seat of Christ. We just read here about... Um, we, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then Paul talks about the gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ. That up there is what matters. Our rewards in heaven. Earning rewards up there. Jesus says, um, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. It's not in vain when you're living a life of Christ and you're trying to witness for Jesus Christ verbally as well as being a living witness because God sees it. Right? But there are times that when you get your eyes get taken off God and you get stuck on the world and you start going on your own understanding. Remember, trust the Lord with all thine heart. Hiding God's word in your heart. It's always a heart issue with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's always a heart issue. All right? But when the head gets in the way, we start looking and going, I don't know if this is really doing any good. I don't even think it's worth doing this anymore. Gospel tracting is just worthless. This is worthless. I've seen a lot of men of God, 
in ministry start doing that, where they start giving up on witnessing for Jesus Christ. And they start making excuses. Well, it's just worthless. It's just a waste of money. And this is just a waste. That's a waste. This is a waste. And I bought into it. But this is great. It's not a waste. If your heart's in the right place, and you're doing preaching the Word, and you're handing out gospel tracts, or you're laying gospel tracts places, it's not a waste. Right. It's not amounting to much, but we need to remember that we are to do the work of the Lord regardless. I'm here to serve Him. We're to do the work of the Lord, and He will handle the rest. We preach the truth. Those who want it, praise God. Those who don't want it, God will deal with them. We move on to the next city. We brush the dust off our feet. Move on to the next city. Uh, let them alone. Then we move on and let God deal with them. And I put, P.S., you will be shocked on how much fruit is still here. People still getting saved in this late hour. That was a big blessing from a sister in Christ. Big blessing. And I hear how the brethren are doing, living their life for Jesus Christ, the changed life, living for Him, getting sin out of their life, wickedness out of their life, learning about this book, learning about the faith, more about the faith than what we're supposed to stand for. And I hear stories of brethren that are gospel tracting also and trying to do their best to be a living witness and a verbal witness. But you'll be shocked. People are still getting saved. We're, as long as we're still here, brothers and sisters Christ, people can still get saved. Are we still here? So we can get saved. Mm -hmm. Don't give up, brothers and sisters Christ. Be ready. Are you ready? To witness. Always be ready to witness. Because it's Christ. I'd like to sing one more hymn if we can before we end this. One to do in Christ alone. It seems like I'm doing some over and over. I just have a small collection that I'm working up on. I've got a book over here that a brother in Christ gave me. And I'm trying to learn some new hymns. But a lot of these are just, they're good hymns and I like them. So in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in help, bliss babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ 
I stand. Brothers of Christ, the Bible talks about the power of the gospel. The power of Christ. Are you standing? Are you ready, brother, says Christ, if the door is open and God opens the door, are you in a standing position where you can be a living witness as well as a verbal witness? You're not all talk, but you're also walk. Please, brother, says Christ, get back out there and gospel tract. Get back out there and gospel tract. Okay? Leave gospel places. You're not an evangelist. You're not out there preaching hardcore like some people call, get called to do it to be an evangelist. But always be ready to give an answer to the hope that's in you. And if you can, get some gospel tracts, and when you go shopping, drop gospel tracts places. When you go places, okay? Always carry one on you, just in case you get into a conversation, and you can hand someone a gospel tract. Okay? Keep being a living witness for Jesus Christ. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Pray for me. I'm still praying for you, brother, sister, Christ, that we all remain standing until he calls us home and continue living for Christ and doing the work of the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray this. I'll see you in the next video.